Thanks so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. So I'm just going to start out by saying what I'm what I'm presenting tonight is is the the course that I'm going to teach. I have a I'm, I'm teaching a, a course starting uh, next week or the week after, and um, this would be the one of the first lectures that I'm going to do. So today, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about uh, sort of the sort of the syllabus and how I'm going to run this class. And then I'm going to give you guys um, some definitions on different realities. I'm going to talk about what are some of the so different social virtual reality worlds, what makes an experience engaging in these in these environments, and then what is the criteria for for making um, these educational and training experiences engaging. And then finally, um, the, the we're not actually going to do a field trip to <laughs> Mozilla Hubs and Frame, but I will be. That, that for my class, that's what I will be doing. So a little bit about me. Um, I was at HP Labs for 21 years, and in fact, at HP for 34. Um, but I was the last, I was a research scientist at HP Labs in Fort Collins. And I have an MS and a PhD in computer science from Colorado State University, and a, and a second master's of library and information science from San Jose State University. Um, I'm also on the faculty of San Jose State University where I teach a very similar course for information professionals. And then I have the research interests in augmented virtual reality design and simulations for education. So my lab, which I will, which I am in the middle of setting up right now at Colorado State University, is, is a lab for AR, VR, and MR specifically focused on education. So here is my syllabus. It's a 16 week course and I'm not going to like read you all of this, but basically what I'm doing is I'm giving for the first six weeks, I am giving a um, it, the class that basically is three hours a week. So I give it for the first half of the class, I give a lecture and then on the second half of the class, we all jump into one of these social virtual reality platforms together and we 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 explore them and we talk about what are some of the affordances of those uh, worlds for what kinds of education. So I will we'll have the the main thing at, on this course is there's a project at the end that um, will be an implementation of an educational or training experience that each student will choose for themselves based on their own domain expertise and and what they're interested in. And so for the last two two actual class sessions the students are going to give presentations and then we're they're going to let us go into their worlds as a class to see what it is that they've done and then finally um i will they they i will grade their project um, based on several things like their requirements document their design their learning assessment and their test their test plans so they have these four different major homeworks that will be done during the course of the semester and at the end they turn in the project but the other nice thing is is that we will have a lot of discussions going on about what we're seeing and what you know questions and and what have you so that's the syllabus now the as i said the first six weeks we visit a different social vr platform and then the second half of the class we get to we get to experience those platforms right and the other thing is is i make absolutely sure that all of those platforms have a desktop version and this is an accessibility issue because we don't want to necessarily um, keep students from from being able to participate because they can't handle actual vr and also because they may not actually be able to afford a vr headset so um, the one thing that I do with when I, and I'm going to show you a little bit later what that criteria is, but I present this set of criteria during the very first lecture. And that's the that's the um, criteria that the students will use for um, determining their projects and what what particular platform they're going to they're going to actually use for their um, for their project. Now, um, the project implementation is 30% and the supporting documentations are 10% each. And again, um, they, there's um, a 
requirements document, a design document, a learning assessment plan, and a test plan. And they have to, they basically have to show me at the end when the project is due that they've actually run their test plan. Um, there's also five discussions, which are um, t a total of 10%. And basically these, are, these discussions are a way for them to, to, to talk to each other and to me about how these criteria are applied to whatever platform that we have visited during that week. And that gives them a really good idea of, of what I'm looking for and, and what are the limitations of each one of these platforms. Because when you've got these students kind of um, discussing all these things, a lot of issues do come up. Okay, and so here is the, the recap of the grades. Um, the project, yeah, it is the largest part, but because they will have done all the supporting documents and will have gotten feedback from me way before the, the, the implementation is due, um, it's not that, it's not really that big a part of their, um, of their, their grade. Um, they will, as I said, they will have to do a presentation and that's going to be a, a, a big part of their grade as well. Um, and that's also just to give them some, some experience actually doing presentations. So then I have this, then I will give them, there's no required textbook. We, we probably need to write that because <laughs> it doesn't <clears throat> really exist yet at this point. But um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand out a lot of documents that are related to social VR platforms. So I've been frantically trying to um, come up with, uh, since we are going to be visiting six different platforms, I've been writing these large sort of handouts for each virtual world to try and get the students up and running inside these virtual worlds. And based on prior experience, <clears throat> excuse me, um, well, let me back up my, and give you a little bit of a, an idea about who my students are. Um, this systems engineering is a is a graduate program. There is no undergraduate at um, in systems engineering. So all the students are either masters or PhD students. And most of them are sort of mid career. And a lot of them come from industry around in Colorado and actually outside because the program is can be online and we have a lot of students online. And it turns out that uh, for systems engineering, we have the largest PhD program at Colorado State with most students. And um, it's it's actually pretty daunting. <laughs> I just started in August. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that that since the since this is experimental and there's really no other than having papers, there's really no sort of you know, textbook yet for this. So that's what I do for them. I just give them papers to read. And a lot of times I'll give them optional papers as well if if they're interested in a specific level. Um, so then, okay, so this is just like some more of the readings. I have a lot more readings than this actually. Okay, so now I'm going to transition. So that's my class. And now I'm going to transition into um, the... Uh, in, this is what I'm going to present to the students. So we start with different realities. And basically for, <clears throat> for um, AR, VR, MR, or mixed reality, that there's a continuum, right? There's the real environment in which we you know, live our everyday life. And there's the virtual environment. For example, what we're standing in here, sitting in here right now is a virtual environment. It's completely closed off. We're not seeing anything in the real world other than our, you know, our computer. Um, in between that, you have augmented re reality and augment. It's something called augmented virtuality. Um, VR basically shuts out the whole, the real world, and AR actually puts digital content in your real world. But the difference between AR and our MR is that. Uh, uh, you can actually manipulate objects, digital objects, in the real world. And this, this is a, a fairly new, it's a fairly new um, area, and people are still really trying to define it at this point. Augmented reality bridges the gap between virtual reality and the physical world. And um, the digital information 
appears to be part of the real world. So, for example, um, heads up display on your um, on on the car is kind of, is a, is is augmented reality because it's uh, updating as you're driving along. Um, some of the characteristics include combining real and virtual. It's interactive in real time, and basically the the difficult part here is you have to be able to register in 3D. So you have to do real time alignment between whatever digital objects you're using in the in the physical world. Um, are these grads gonna? They're going, yes, the students are going to have to create an, an ex educational experience in one of six virtual worlds that, that I've chosen. Um, and so uh, that in the, the six virtual worlds are either Mozilla Hubs and our frame, so a, a, an XR, a, a web based XR platform. Um, Altspace is another one, ScienceSpace is one. Um, but anyway, um, for, for augmented reality, so you, you basically have these components that you need to um, that you need to take care of for tracking, registration, visualization. Now, the reason I bring up augmented reality is that I am not going if 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 I have students who are for for whatever reason can't handle virtual reality but are very interested in doing a training using augmented virtual augmented reality then I will allow them so I'm going to give them some information on what augmented reality is in case they decide to go that direction because again remember I'm, my students are all people who are, are people who are in industry and in many cases they work with things like you know high like um, um, complicated machinery that a augmented reality would be perfect for training on so there's a bunch of different kinds of um, applications for augmented reality. There's industry and construction, there's maintenance and training, and there's medical um, where, and, and I have actually have um, a group of students in um, the uh, biomedical department who are doing something very similar to this, where they're trying to put an, an x-ray overlay on so for, for needle, for 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 precisely putting a, a needle into a patient for a shot or or whatever for whatever reason um there's also navigation and we have another project going on um which um, and we've actually already done a grant for for um, using heads up displays to help people understand their self-driving cars <laughs> um, <laughs> um there's um language real-time language translation uh, and personal information display. This is very helpful if, say, you're in a foreign country and you don't understand the language and you just don't want to order something like liver off the menu. You have no idea what it is, so you can use something like this to translate it for you on the fly. Um, no, they do not have a background in Unity 3D. We will have a lecture on Unity and Unreal Engine and some of the other tools that are needed, and it it, they, it will be up to them to if they already have experience, then that's great. If they don't and they're interested, they can go off and learn it. But one of the things that I've found since I started working at CSU is that finding people, finding students who have that experience is actually very difficult. And um, in some of the projects that are ongoing on campus, um, the professors that have these, these projects just basically to, point the students to an Udemy or a Coursera um, course to learn how to use Unity and, and, and Unreal Engine. Um, it most there's really no bandwidth on campus to to do to teach the, the those skills, those tools. So then there's virtual reality, which is at the other end of the other end of the spectrum. And virtual reality is a completely digitally created environment that's viewed from inside of your headset. And navigation is based on head referencing, which allows you to look to look around and walk around. Um, it allows for a perception of depth and a sense of space. Um, they can ex be experienced in full scale. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever tried to play Minecraft in virtual reality, but it's absolutely terrifying because the the sort of the creepers and the scary dudes are eight feet tall. 
<laughs> instead of you know two inches on a on a flat screen. Um, you can interact with virtual objects, and um, immersion can be enhanced with auditory, haptic, and other non-visual technologies. Now, for social virtual reality, we also have to have networks, right? We have to be able to, to be in the same space at the same time, so that means we need a network of some kind. Um, some of the applications, and these are applications that kind of the kinds of things that we are looking at for my lab at, 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 at Colorado State is um, training and first responder training, um, simulations for like driving simulations, and then in engineering, building and implementing designs for testing is really important. And then um, um, doing things like uh, assessing faults and structural weaknesses, for, for example, in civil engineering. Um, and then there's mixed reality. And again, I think I, I, I kind of feel like mixed reality is one of those things where we don't really quite have that definition down yet. Um, it's closer to augmented reality than virtual reality. And basically, it's supposed to overlay digital object, objects and be um, um, manipula be able to ma manipulate it. So for example, if you put a virtual 3D box on a physical table, you should be able to open it and look inside or move the box around or whatever. It's not an area that's very well developed, in my opinion, yet. Some of the applications for mixed reality are virtual training for police, so being able to re-experience crime scenes without actually being there, um, uh, being and being able to, to, to do this without contaminating evidence, doing remote guidance for construction workers, so alignment of holographic data and comparing plans against works that's actually completed. And then for engineering, civil engineering are very large scale projects like bridges and dams, what have you. You can have walk around hologram images and be able to manipulate those images as you're, you know, like maybe scaling um, spot spots to see if there's anything missing. Okay, so then the next thing we're going to talk about is social virtual reality worlds. Now, the definition is it's an online environment, virtual environment that can be experienced using virtual headsets, but it can also be experienced using 2D desktop programs like the one we're, we're using for Second Life right now. And it can be experienced in real time with others. So examples are Verbella, Science Space, Rec Room, VR Chat, Alt Space, Engage VR, and Mozilla Hubs. And the ones that I'm taking to my students to are Verbella, ScienceSpace, VR Chat, Alt Space, Mozilla Hubs, Spatial, and uh, Frame. And these are just sort of pictures of. Um, I have a a group. Um, it's called the the VR Exploders Club. And every third Friday of the month, we pick a platform and we all go and experience it together and kind of hang out and play around and see if we can shoot sidearm with arrows. So here, here are some, uh, <laughs> here are some um, social virtual reality platforms. And many of you may have seen this before, but um, this, is a, this is put together by um, a, a, a group called XR Collaboration or Ignite, XR Ignite. And it's a it it kind of looks like a record to me, but um, it's kind of uh, separated by types of VR experience, social VR experiences. So basically, what all of these have in common is that that there's networking underneath, and you can experience these places with more than one person. But what's interesting about it is if you look at the uh, the number of platforms for each type of of experience, um, the by far the largest one is industrial and enterprise, right? And then um, when you get down to um, gaming, it's very low. And let me see, education platforms is 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 pretty good. Um, I don't really understand what remote presence means. I think that means like um, having a, a, something you can do a meeting in or a conference or something like that, but. But social events and entertainment is actually pretty high up there. And I expect this thing is going to change every single year. 
But the interesting thing here is, is we have 149 of these things and none of us could be um, experts in, in, you know, even, you know, 10 of these, let alone 149. Okay. Um, so the escape clause here is that, that, and this is what I tell my students, that, I, that, that not all VR platforms have and get been investigated. What I'm focusing on is education, training, and collaboration. And all of these platforms must have a desktop version because there are some that don't. And um, some of the information is not published. So there's things that, that are, I, I guess you could call them hidden features or pain in the pain in, I don't know. But anyway, there it's really hard to find information on why something works or does not work. Um, I'm not an expert on all of these platforms and the the time limitations won't let me get into the nitty gritty t detail on all of those platforms, even the six that I'm that I'm sh taking them to. And by the time I deliver this this lecture, many more platforms will have been born and many will have died. I heard a rumor that that roomy is gone. OK, now what makes for engaging experiences? Well, presence. And then we all know in this in this group, we all know what presence what presence means, right? It means that you know it's it's feeling like we're all here together in the same space as if we were in the same room. Um, there's but there's three kinds of presence. One is the personal presence that makes us feel you know how 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 well do we feel like we're at actually in this space? Social presence is the extent to which all of you guys are here and feel like real people and not, for example, NPCs. And then environmental presence, meaning can I interact with things in this environment or am I just sitting in kind of a 360 environment where I'm watching, you know, things go by, but I can't move anything and I can't touch anything. So an important concept for measuring the quality of a virtual environment experience is, is presence. So basically the greater the sense of presence, the more engaging the experience will be. And then there's this idea of immersion. And a lot of people confuse presence and immersion, but immersion is, an, a, is a technical um, quality, right? It's how's the audio, how's the video, what's the frame rate, you know, where, wh how, how much um, of a, an illusion of depth can you get out of this environment? What's the field of view? When you're in a headset, you know, the, the, the wider the field of, field of view, the more realistic it's going to be because you're, it's going to more, be more like your eyes where you can see, you know, a certain number of degrees of degrees on either side of your head. Um, and then there's this haptical, haptic wearable functionality. Um, do the tools function in a natural way? The thing that drives me crazy about virtual reality without, with, with the way things are set up with controllers is that you know it, it, most of these have the sort of Netflix approach to 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 texting? You have to pick out every letter that you want to um, to use with not not using your your fingers, right? Now, designing engaging experiences for education and training. What, what I am using, so this is the criteria that I spoke about earlier, and this is based on a survey that we at Vacara did about, I don't know, three years ago now, um, and where we asked educators in Second Life and other virtual reality worlds what they needed in order to make, to, to make an engaging experience in one of these, in one of these environments. And basically, we at, we asked him about things like, you know, do you need chat? Do you need voice? Do you need to be able to build on the spot? Um, you know, and I will and I will say that most of this criteria came out of the experience of using Second Life or Kitely, um, not um, not from some of the other virtual rea uh, social virtual reality worlds because we kind of feel that this area this this platform is is the gold standard, um, not only because it's been around the longest, but I feel like there's been more educators here who figured out how to do many things that we still can't do in virtual reality. So there's several of these. Um, and um, basically we asked the, the educators to go ahead and kind of rank these on, on 
need or must um it's a must it's a want or it's a need and then what we had was um the answers to this so one of the things that we 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 think we we had something like 59 or 60 responses so it's still it's considered statistically significant um so this is just kind of an example of one of the questions was how long have you been used and this is important because um i i feel like for the educators who have been in other spaces they have a much better idea of what is needed so if you look at expertise as as kind of a um you know one one level and then you 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 look at what the answer is based on expertise is then you find out um you know what what uh what really what's really needed so for example how long have you been interested um how long have you used vr and um you'll see that not it hasn't been around very long so it has it's not it's not going to be a lot um but why are you interested in vr most people said i'm interested because we want to be able to use it both in in, in the physical world as well as in a ver as as virtually and as we have found from covid 19 now um being able to deliver education virtually has become much much more important and this was done before covid 19 hit <coughs> excuse me and then we asked you know what, what virtual Plat reality platforms do you use and I don't know if you can see um, I don't know if you can see the table on the right here very well but basically this is sort of this is sort of the data right for each one of the criteria we asked is it needed is it wanted it would be nice or not necessary and so once we compiled that data then we looked at we had a, I think a cutoff at a, at about 65 percent and any anything above 65 percent we we considered it to be important so we came up with these this top eight criteria which is ability to communicate via speech and world ability to give presentations with slide viewers it has to be easy to get in you have to get be able to get a decent avatar you have to have a protocol in place for harassment. You have to be able to show videos and do other multimedia functionality. Has to have desktop access. Um, these, it must be easy to transport between areas. And then this, there needs to be an ability for people who are wearing headsets and people at desktops to be able to interact with each other. Now, it, this may seem really obvious to everybody in this audience, but if you go out and start exploring some of these virtual social virtual reality worlds, you'll find that that a lot of these these this criteria doesn't exist yet. And it's really important. Um, for example, um, you know, the the fact that um, you have to be able to block offenders or that you have to be able to um, you know put a do a do a presentation in world believe it or not it's actually hard because of the way a lot of these these worlds are set up okay so then the next thing is identifying a workable vr platform so after we have all these criteria then we go we start out and we look at all the vr platforms out there that we know are good for education or could be used for education and we we try to find which ones um, we should investigate. And this particular chart is based on um, a social VR platforms uh, chart that Ryan Schultz put together again a, a, a few years ago. But as you can see, for example, and, and many of the people who have been in the VR Exploders, we've been to Altspace, we've been to Engage, um, some of these, for example, any land, um, there is no desktop version, so we can't we can't even consider it. Um, Mozilla Hubs is another one. We considered Mozilla Hubs to be um, a gateway drug because it's basically jump in into a, using a web browser. It's very easy to move around. Um, it's kind of the the starting the starting point and this is one of the first places I will take to my students so they just get an idea of what it's like to be in a 3D world. Um, 
<clears throat> then the other thing is you'll notice again as i said before that that many of the many of the platforms that existed 10 minutes ago are gone and high fidelity is one of them um now interesting enough um I, oh, and we thought sansar was gone too for a f couple of minutes but it, it actually came back online um so rec room is another one and science space but i am not taking my 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 students to rec room mostly because i think it's 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 hard to um it's hard to get 3d content in and and manipulate things there um vr chat is the is another place that that we're going and for many of you i don't know if you've ever been in vr chat or know much about vr chat but vr chat is is the second life of virtual social virtual reality platforms they've had something on the order of um, a few hundred thousand um, users a day and so they're it, it's really going gangbusters at this point okay now it's break time <laughs> um, so this is this is at this point in time and it sounds to me like I'm going to have to come up with some more slides because it's only 6.30 or 5.36. Um, but at this point in time, I give my students a break. And then when we come back, we talk about next week's field trip. So in this case, then the next, next week's field trip would be Verbella. But then after we talk about how we get into Verbella and I give them some documentation and they are required to go off on their own, get their own accounts, download it, maybe go in for a few minutes and um, um, you know play around with it so they can get a feel for how it works before we all jump in together. But then on the very first one, I'm just going to give them a link. Yeah, I know you can't create in, the, in Verbella at all, but what's nice about Verbella I have to say it's probably has the nicest user and easiest user interface that, that exists out there. So it's very easy to get in and start moving around and looking at things. Um, what I think you could do in Verbella is um, do presentations. So if you're, if you're, um, if your training experience is just to give a presentation, then it's probably fine. Yeah, it's a good business tool. So what I so what I do is I at, when we come back from break I give them a URL and then we jump into Mozilla Hubs and then I have a list of places where um, where we will go. So San Jose State University iSchool has their own build. I've done one for VR Exploders and I've done another one for um, the work of my students from San Jose State University. And we'll just hop around and they'll get a they'll get a a, a feel for what it's like to be in these virtual worlds. And then um, from there, there is a there is a link to the Vacara and I think CVL frame, which is iLearns or no, that's for Bella's web based thing. Um, we'll go there. And so um, so so it's just like sort of a gentle introduction for students to, to kind of get a feel for what is what is a virtual world how you move around. The nice thing about a lot of these, these, these platforms is that the way you move around is the same. WASD keys or um, arrow keys if you're on desktop. Um, then um, the, other, the other issue is that I am not going to try at all to, let every, to, to tell everybody how to use each one of these platforms in whatever headset they have. So, you know, they could have a Quest, they could have um, a Vive port, they could have an, um, an HP Reverb. I, I don't know, I am not, I, I have decided that I'm, that I'm going to, I think they're mature enough to go figure out how to use their own controls. Um, and then once they are able to get in, in VR, most of the interface is the same for desktop and VR. They just have to figure out, you know, how do you bring up the main menu? What, what, which button on the controller they have to push to get to the main menu? I don't feel like I think we could waste a lot of time um, trying to 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 teach them how to use their own headsets. I don't think it's it's feasible at this point. <clears throat> 